And he said to him, Rise and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A lady named Linda May Richardson, writing for the Victory in the Valley, a nonprofit corporation dedicated to helping cancer sufferers, wrote the following short story. She titled it The Seventh Friend. Upon her initial diagnosis of cancer, she wrote, my first friend came and expressed shock by saying, I can't believe you have cancer. I always thought that you were active and healthy. He left and I felt alienated and somehow very different. My second friend came and brought me information about treatments used for cancer and said, whatever you do, don't take chemotherapy, it's a poison. She left, and I felt scared and confused. My third friend came and tried to answer my whys with the statement, perhaps God is disciplining you for some sin you committed in your life. She left, and I felt judged. My fourth friend came and told me, if your faith is great enough, God will heal you. She left, and I felt guilty. My fifth friend came and told me to remember that all things work together for good. She left, and I felt angry. My sixth friend never came at all. I felt sad and alone. My seventh friend came and held my hand and said, I care. I'm here. I want to help you through this. She left, and I fell off. It's not unusual for people to turn to God for help when trying to come to grips with a serious illness. And while we pray to God for healing for ourselves and for those around us, what we're more likely to be asking for is to be cured of whatever it is that ails us. Through the effects of modern medicine and the power of prayer, sometimes we get better and we become cured of whatever the dis-ease is. Sadly, however, there are times when we are compelled to watch a loved one, a spouse, a parent, a child, a dear friend, become sicker and sicker, and then die. What happened, we ask? We prayed to God for healing. Where was the answer? Where was the recovery that we prayed so hard for? There's an old story. I suppose it could be taken as a sort of joke, not that there's anything humorous about being ill, but it makes a good point. There was a lady whose inflexible religious faith caused her to place her life completely in God's hands. She didn't believe in medicine. She placed her well-being solely in God's grace and power to heal. Finding herself gravely ill, she goes to the hospital. The first doctor comes to her and says, your condition is very curable. We have a procedure that will make you completely well again. The lady refuses the treatment. She says she'll put her trust in God to cure her. The second doctor visits her and says, look, it's not too late. We can still reverse the process of your ailments and save your life. Again, she refuses. A third doctor comes to her and pleads with her to accept the treatment that will save her life. Again, and for the last time, she says no. Eventually, she dies. And coming face to face with God in the afterlife, she says, What happened? I prayed to you beautifully. I've been a good Christian. I ask 
asked you to heal me, and I was just left to languish and die. To which God replies, what do you mean? I sent three doctors to cure you. But is the curing of a physical condition or ailment the same thing as healing? In today's gospel, Jesus, through Luke's words, draws a line between the two. Nine of the ten lepers go to the priests to be inspected in order to be declared free of any disease and therefore no longer unclean. But it is the tenth leper, the Samaritan, a foreigner, an outcast. Only he returns to Jesus to give him thanks. Upon where he is told, rise and go on your way, your faith has made you well. What we are being taught here is that there is a difference between being cured of a disease and being healed. Leprosy, now known as Hansen's disease, is a terrible ailment. It is a chronic infectious disease caused by a bacterium that affects the skin and peripheral nerves, causing a wide range of clinical manifestations. Hansen's is associated with skin lesions, nodules, plaques, thickened dermis, and frequent involvement of the nasal mucosa, resulting in painful nasal congestion. In short, it looks pretty gruesome and it feels even worse. If left untreated, as it was in the ancient world, the resulting nerve damage can cause crippling of the hands and feet, paralysis, and even blindness. Is leprosy still a thing, you might be asking? According to the World Health Organization, in 2021, that's last year, the number of new cases detected worldwide was 140,546, the majority of them occurring in Southeast Asia. Worldwide, between 1 and 2 million persons remain permanently disabled as a result of Hansen's disease, leprosy. However, thanks to modern medicine, treatment is now very effective, and persons receiving the proper antibiotic treatment can be freed of any active infection. These types of treatments were obviously not available in Jesus' time, and the effects, which were both painful and life-changing, were magnified by a culture that vilified the poor, the downtrodden, and especially the diseased, who were considered to be unclean by religious standards. The very notion that Jesus was able to cure these ten men of this dreadful affliction is nothing short of miraculous. Cure, yes. Only one was truly healed. Only one was made whole by virtue of his gratitude to the Son of God. Jesus cured the man, but it was his own faith that truly healed him. It's easy to see the connection between the gospel we heard last week, where the disciples were asking Jesus to increase their faith, here, we can not only see the power of faith, we can also see the difference between being cured and being healed. Becoming fully healed is never easy. Not only does it require faith in God, there will also be things that block our ability to be truly healed. These stumbling blocks can come from our own inability to forgive others or perhaps even our own sense of unworthiness, or a negative approach towards our own healing. And healing can come in all shapes and sizes. Physical healing, emotional healing, healing of the soul. However, being cured is pretty much what we pray for when we petition God to make someone or ourselves well again. So how can we be truly healed? After all, it is doctors who cure, it is Jesus who heals.
through healing and a desire to allow the Holy Spirit to make us whole again requires a strong prayer regimen at the center of our lives, along with a willingness and a desire to be healed. Many doctors will tell their patients who are suffering from all manner of illnesses that the power of prayer really does help. Spiritual healing comes from re-establishing the balance, the harmony that exists between mind, body, and spirit when a person lives a Christ-centered life. Faith in Christ can undo the disorganization of our lives made evident by the evil, chaos, and mayhem that is so prevalent in our world today. Eastern religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, and Tao, have understood this for a very long time. Rather than focusing on any one central figure, they have chosen to observe the serenity brought about by a strong sense of spirituality. As Christians, one of our biggest problems is we don't really talk about the calming of our own lives through contemplative and centering prayer. Not nearly enough, anyway. Members of monastic groups, such as monks, friars, nuns, sisters, anchorites, anchoresses, hermits, they get it. Choosing to dedicate their lives to worshiping God and through a highly structured prayer life, they have effectively slowed down the insanity of this world. It is through quieting the noise of a frenzied and tumultuous world through corporate and personal prayer. It is these practices that allow their spirits to be healed. It should come as no surprise that many studies have shown that members of cloistered religious groups live longer than their secular counterparts. Additionally, a simple wholesome diet of natural food without the taint of chemicals and preservatives doesn't hurt either. I stayed a couple of times with a religious community that resides on the Isle of Iona on the west coast of Scotland where all three meals a day were comprised almost exclusively of vegetables grown in their windswept garden and dairy products from their small farm. I will warn you, however, that there are some mildly deleterious and somewhat embarrassing effects that could be the result of a diet comprised mostly of legumes. <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> so is there hope for us? Absolutely there is. And that is one of the main points of being Christian. And as scripture repeatedly tells us, it's never too late to change the path we are on. While I cannot replace the contemplative and serene world of the monastery for you, I do hope and pray that for 75 minutes every Sunday, you can escape the disorder of this tumultuous world. A balanced, healthy diet, coupled with physical and spiritual exercise, that will go a long way. And I absolutely recommend a strong prayer life along with an equally strong faith in Christ. And like the tenth leper, we should be praising and thanking Christ for all that he gives us. This is a good place to start as we seek to find balance between mind, body, and soul. Because when we found that balance, that true sense of spiritual equilibrium, only then can we be healed through the power of the Holy Spirit 
even when our physical bodies cannot be mended. In the name of the Father, the Son, 